<laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, it would be, I think, very productive if you ask questions rather than uh, just listen to what I say. It will be more interactive and more interesting for all parties involved. So my plan is to first uh, describe some motivation and history of uh, various uh, chiral ring uh, questions and how they played a role in the early days of the ADS-CFT correspondence and various other things. So I'll uh, do some a, li a little bit of that and then we'll uh, plunge into the details. So I'll start with some history involving the n, e n equals 4 maxim uh, maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory in four dimensions. Uh, so this subject uh, started its life in around 1998. That's more or less uh, when the first uh, paper on the subject appeared in the context of maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory. And I'll try to describe what people have been interested in back in the day, how that played a role in the ADS-CFT correspondence, and then we'll discuss modern developments, uh, which are from uh, 2010 and onwards, where people have managed to generalize uh, many of the statements to n equals 2. And as you'll see, n equals 2 appears to be much more interesting. Uh, there are various perturbative aspects uh, instantons, resurgence. I'll talk. Ab I'll mention a little bit at the end some connections to resurgence and many other questions uh, of, uh, of of of, uh, of interest. So, okay. So let me start. So in n equals four, there is a family of uh, in n equals four. We'll discuss some uh, aspects first at uh, zero coupling. So what is n equals 4 maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory? This is basically an SUN uh, gauge field and uh, six scalars in the adjoint representation and then uh, some uh, wild uh, fermions that uh, would not play a huge role in this motivational speech. Uh, this is, this scalars <coughs> are in the, this uh, fermions and scalars are in the adjoint representation. So a family of operators that people have considered early on in uh, the subject are uh, the following. So let me define them. So these are single trace operators made out of uh, k adjoint scalars. So i1, i, uh, k, where each of the indices i runs over 1 and 6, from 1 to 6. And C is some tensor. So I is the label of, I is just like an index of the tensor. There could be several tensors, and these are the actual indices. And uh, it turned out uh, that it's useful to, uh, for reasons, uh, this is just some history, so I'm not going to be extremely pedagogical or systematic. It's just like uh, trying to remind you of some things that were important 20 years ago. So it turned out that the, uh, these tensors, have to be symmetric and traceless for what I say to be true. The, uh, the reason for this restriction, that these tensors are symmetric and traceless, in that way they would be ir in irreducible representations of uh, irreducible representations of uh, uh, SO6. So this model has an SO6 symmetry. Uh, acting on these indices, and in this way they are in some symmetric traceless representation of SO6. <coughs> and these operators are half BPS. <coughs> so they are annihilated by half of the supercharges of this uh, theory. Okay, so these, are, these operators played a very important role uh, back in the day. <coughs> now, we will, uh, now I'll tell you how, what's special about these operators. So these operators have many uh, interesting properties. I'll just try to remind you of a few of them. Sorry, my tag fell. So uh, the properties that would, so first we'll, I'll normalize these uh, tensors so that when we sum over all the indices, this is just one. So this is just a choice of normalization of these tensors. Uh, so 
more generally, more generally, I'll put two, in, two different indices here, I1 and I2. And that will be just the delta function of I1 and I2. So that, that's how we'll normalize these operators. And now the action, the action is going to be normalized as usual. So it's 2 times g and mu squared. And then there is a trace of f squared plus that attack. So that's how the action is normalized as usual. And um, <coughs> the propagator in the free field theory. So let's. So now we're discussing just free field theory. Uh, at zero coupling. So the propagator of phi i to phi j from x to y is normalized as a consequence uh, uh, just by g young mil squared over 2 pi uh, squared. And then there is a delta function in ij. There are some color indices here, a and b. So these are like the elements of the matrix. Uh, 1 over the distance squared. So that's my normalization for, for the propagator. OK. And using this information, you can now compute correlation functions of these operators at zero coupling. It's just like free weak constructions. It's a straightforward exercise. So uh, let's do, uh, we'll do a few examples and then we'll talk about the uh, interest, the, the surprising properties of this. Of this. Yes? Maybe a trivial question, but by zero coupling, we mean the lowest order in asymptotic small. <laughs> Yeah, I just mean, uh, well, by zero coupling, you could, you could mean the Born approximation more precisely that there are no loops. So you only use uh, weak, weak, weak contractions. So oftentimes there will be some dependence of the on the coupling, but it just arises from the normalization of the propagators. OK? So you don't allow for any loops. So it's like the leading non-trivial order. So I'm. So if you just use those formulas, you can compute uh, the two-point function of uh, arbitrary such two operators uh, just using weak constructions. So my convention is going to be, so there will be k of those and then j of the j1 to jk. So you have to have the same amount, the same number of fields in the two-point function. Otherwise, it would uh, vanish for obvious reasons. So this is at x, and this is at y. So you have to have the same number of fields. Otherwise, there are no uh, weak contractions to contemplate. And you can just take it as a small exercise uh, to just do the weak contractions using no the normalizations that I've defined. And you can just show, if I have not made a mistake, that this is g to the power 2k young mills. Then there is 2 pi to the power 2k. And then there is a delta function of i1, j1, delta function of uh, i2, j2, ta -ta 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 -ta. and then ik, jk, plus cyclic permutations. And this is the answer in the planar limit. Uh, so Sorry, times 1 over the distance. I forgot about that. So to the power 2k. And this is the answer in the planar, in the planar limit. So only if you take planar diagrams. You can just take it as a small exercise to, to check. Does, anyone, does every, everybody know what is the large n limit? What is the Tooft expansion? Does anybody not know? What is 1 over n expansion? OK. So this is the answer for this two-point function in the, large, in the large n expansion. You can, of course, write an exact answer for any n. It's just that uh, this is what we will need for uh, the discussion here. And now, using the fact that these coefficients c were chosen to be orthonormal, and using this formula, we can write the two-point function uh, for these OIs. So this is all zero coupling. I haven't used the half BPS nature of these operators yet. So we, we can write OI, OI 
all i prime. Let me just not mess up the normalization. So this is at x, this is at y. So there will be a lambda to the k, where lambda is the fifth coupling, as usual. So we have lambda to the power k times k over uh, 2 pi 2k, and then <coughs> x minus y to the power 2k, <coughs> and then delta i1, i2. Oh, sorry, i and i prime. OK, so this is the two-point function of uh, these operators. And uh, there's nothing uh, interesting about it. It's just like the free field theory answer. A more then people went on, and they computed the three-point function. And that's going to be the main subject of our discussion. So we have i1, i2, i3. So the three-point function is where the physics uh, lies. The two-point function it can be viewed just as a normalization, uh, a normalization of the of the operators. Gives the dimension. Right. So the two-point function tells you the three-level dimension. Uh, we'll discuss the quantum corrections to that, and the three-point function yes. uh, has a little bit of a miracle to it that I'm going to try to explain. So first of all, uh, we have to discuss when does this uh, three-point function uh, vanish or not vanish. OK? So, so the picture in a tree level is quite clear. We have an operator O, which has uh, k lines coming out of it. Let's say k1 lines from the operator O i1. And then there is another operator with uh, k2 lines coming out and another operator with k3 lines coming out. We're only interested in the planar limit. OK? Remember that we're only interested in the planar limit. So we have to draw a diagram that doesn't have self-intersections. So how can such a diagram look like? So the idea is that you can connect some lines here, then some lines here, and then the remaining lines connect, sorry, and then the remaining lines connect here. So that's how these diagrams are going to typically look like, OK? So that there are no self-intersections. So there are several observations you can make. So the first observation is that if one of those k's is bigger than the sum of the two other k's, there cannot be any diagrams. So uh, we need that k, uh, let's say, 1 is smaller than k2 plus k3. Uh, k2 is smaller than k1 plus k3. And k3 is smaller than k1 plus k2. If any of these conditions is violated, then there cannot be any diagrams at tree level. Is that clear? And uh, then it's useful to define. Uh, if 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 any of this uh, if any of these conditions, uh, yeah, your, well, yes, if any of these conditions is violated, that there are no diagrams. So no diagrams if not satisfied. Thank you. So no diagrams otherwise. Otherwise. Okay. Now. Um, so it's useful to define uh, alpha which is, uh, let's say, alpha 3 is going to be defined as k1 plus k2 minus k3 over 2, and so on. We'll define these combinations, which we'll call alpha 3, alpha 2, alpha 1. OK, so you can just check as a homework exercise that the tree level, if I did not make a mistake, you find uh, this answer. I'll define sigma in a second. So we have k1, k2, k3. And then there is a certain construction of the tensor structures. This is just group theory. This is an SO6 invariant that you form out of the C's by contracting the indices of the C tensors in, 
an analogous fashion, where like alpha one, where some indices from here contract with some indices here, and then the other ones with those, and the remaining ones come back here. So it's like a planar contraction of the SO6 indices. And then this is divided by x minus y uh, 2 alpha 3 x minus a uh, let's say z 2 alpha 2 and then y minus z 2 alpha 1 so okay so let's make make a few comments about it first of all the space time dependence of this two point function and three point functions is not surprising. This is the general dependence on the coordinates of any three-point function of primary operators in any conformal field theory. Does, uh, I was told that you know what primary operators are in a conformal field theory. So this dependence on x, y, and z is not surprising. Uh, and now there, there are these prefactors. So what has been observed in 98 is the following. And that's uh, where it becomes a little bit more mysterious. So far, we just discussed a uh, free field theory, so there was nothing mysterious about it. So these are. So let me just tell you some observations from. From. Uh, so observations from around 1998, 2000, about these uh, three-point functions and two-point functions. Oh, I forgot to define sigma. Sigma is uh, uh, the sum of uh, the k's. So sigma is the k1 plus k2 plus k3. <coughs> Thank you for reminding me. OK, so now there were some observations that were uh, really miraculous at the time. So observation number one, which is uh, in some sense a trivial, trivial observation, is that since these are half BPS operators, their dimension is not pre-normalized since it's related to some R charge. So, so the dimension of OI is just K, where K is the number of free fields we use in the construction of that operator. So this is just because it's a half BPS, and it's a coupling independent, half, half BPS, and this is coupling constant independent. So in particular, the power here and the powers here are not going to depend on the coupling constant because they follow from just a conformal invariance. The more interesting observation, which in fact was not proved in the original papers, was that uh, you could take this expression, which we, you got from a free field diagram, and compare it to ADS-CFT. ADS-CFT is infinite lambda. So the ADS, the ADS, ADS dual of n equals 4 allows you to do calculations at infinite coupling rather than at zero coupling. And people have just observed numerically, so to speak, or empirically, more precisely, that it's exactly the same. So it seems that uh, it, se it seemed at the time that therefore the three-point functions are independent of the coupling constant. So you could just compute them at zero coupling and uh, infer some properties of the infinitely coupled theory, infinitely strongly coupled theory, which has an ADS dual. And then people have done some very impressive checks of the ADS-CFT correspondence <laughs> where the same prefactors can be obtained in the ADS dual from three-point complex in the bulk. So there are these Witten diagrams, which correspond to, this, uh, to some fields in the bulk that correspond to these primary operators. And the three-point couplings that so in supergravity exactly reproduce these prefactors. Uh, even though they were computed in completely different regimes, and a priori it was not, a, it was not justified. OK, Th that's uh, comment number one. And then there is another property of these operators, which is very nice. Th these are not yet extremal. Now I'll define what is extremal. Are there any questions about that? So in the original papers, this was not, there, nobody gave a proof that this is supposed to be independent of the coupling. But the proofs using uh, harmonic superspace and various rather advanced techniques appeared later. 
So we now know that this is true, that in these three point fun this particular three point functions can be computed exactly at three level. In fact, not just in the planar limit, this is true for any n, and uh, that's why these comparisons were, well, retrospectively justified. So the ADS uh, stuff was basically saying that loop corrections will all be zero? Yes, so on the filtery side, it means that uh, uh, for corrections, loop corrections in filtery, like, you know, like these kind of diagrams would have to vanish. Miraculously, they all have to vanish. And on the ADS side, it means that loop corrections in the bulk have to vanish. So these corrections have to vanish. So both have to vanish exactly for this class of observables. Okay, so, yeah. Are there simpler proofs? No, so uh, you, the point of this lecture is, is that this is about maximally supersymmetric angles theory. I haven't yet defined what extremal correlators are. These are, these are non-extremal in general. That's how the terminology goes. I'll define now a subset of observables which are called extremal. I'll show you that they obey even slightly more restricted properties. And then we'll, f we'll discuss an an analogs of those constructions with less supersymmetry. But there is no simple proof of this fact. I mean, even now, if you were to, uh, if you were if you were to come up with a proof, you would not have an easy time. It's a, it's a extremely non-trivial in my opinion. Notice that there are half BPS, but uh, they are not necessarily half BPS with respect to the same Q. So this preserves some half super, this preserves some other half of supersymmetry, but they're not necessarily the same a half. You see what I'm saying? So you cannot, it's not, it's not an obvious statement. Um, also, if you're familiar with n equals 1 supersymmetry, you know that when you have a half BPS operators, the correlation functions are distance independent, while here they are definitely distance independent. So the non renormalization property is like in some sense of the prefactor, not of the distance dependence. There is a non trivial distance dependence, it's just that the prefactor doesn't run. So it's a, it's a non trivial fact that even nowadays there is no easy proof, as far as I know. Okay, now. There is another, you could ask, okay, what about endpoint functions? Okay, those are two and three point functions, but what about endpoint functions? So as you know from conformal field theory, the, three point, the position dependence of three point functions is completely fixed by conformal invariance. So the fact that we knew the position dependence here exactly is not surprising. Endpoint functions, however, have non-trivial cross ratios in general. And so the question is not about just the normalization of the four endpoint function, but also do we actually know the position dependence? So, <coughs> so here, th this is where extremal comes in. This is where the notion of extremality comes in. <coughs> so it's useful to label the operators instead of by this indices I1 to IN. I'll just label them by delta 1 to delta N. It's just more convenient when we, that's, that will be more convenient when we discuss n equals 2. So delta is the dimension. Delta i is just ki. Okay, so it's the number of fields we use to define that single trace operator. So that's, um, that, that, that labeling is just more convenient. And in fact, so what is, what is extremal? Extremal correlator is the, is a special case of, of, of uh, this family of correlators where there is like a delta, which is the sum of the other deltas. Okay, so it's exactly the, the case where one of those inequalities is uh, saturated. So for a three point function, that would mean that let's say delta three <coughs> is delta two plus delta one. That would mean that the diagrams are in fact a little bit simpler. They would look like this. So there won't be any contractions at tree level between two operators, but there will be contractions going from some mother operator to the daughters. But there won't be any contractions between the two light operators. So extremal, this is the definition of extremal, and that definition will ca carry over to less supersymmetry. Let's say uh, some, I'll just change the notation a little bit. So we'll just add another operator with some uh, big delta and put it at y, okay? 
So delta is the sum of delta i. So it's a special case of this, con of this general family of, of correlation functions. And it's an interesting notion because that notion carries over to less supersymmetry, naturally. So if the operator is extremal, we can make a definite statement about the position dependence of general n plus one point functions. And let me make that statement. And that also can be contrasted with the idea CFT correspondence. Sorry, let's see if there is anything here that. This definition is reserved for four dimensions. Otherwise, you would add the, the dimension of the field on that definition? No, no, no. The, that definition, that one, dimen one scaling dimension is the sum of all the rest, is a uniform in dimension. No, but the delta i equals k. Oh, that, that one, yeah, that one is just the relation between the dimension of the operator and the number of fields. This is special to four dimensions. But the notion of extremality is this, OK? This is the notion of extremality. And this is more general than just four dimensions. Yeah. Is the point of this that you can somehow reduce it to uh, products of two-point functions? Or? In, in some way, yes. Yes, in some way, yeah. Uh, this is just a historical, uh, still a historical uh, discussion. Yeah, we'll see what are the, but in some way, yes, you can reduce it to lower point functions in some sense. So let's write the answer. So we have delta one, delta n, and then we have O delta y. So the general position dependence of this n plus one point function is known. So there is some prefactor, A, which depends on all the dimensions and on the coupling on N and on the Young-Mills coupling constant. We'll later argue that, in fact, it's independent of the Young-Mills coupling constant, but never mind that. Uh, so then there is a product of 1 over Y minus Xi to the power 2 delta i. And this product runs from 1 to n. And in fact, this is independent of the coupling constant up to some uh, uh, trivial prefactor like we had here, lambda to some power. So there is some lambda to some power, uh, which is uh, given basically by the sum of dimensions. Then there is some function of the deltas n n, which is analogous analogous to this thing. And then there is some position dependence which is fixed. So the position dependence is completely fixed, and the coupling dependence is trivial. So the position dependence is fixed, and coupling dependence is trivial. So these are the extremal correlators. That's what's special about extremal. The descent point functions take this very simple form. If this condition is not obeyed, then this answer is not correct. So it's only for extremal correlators that this is the right answer for endpoint functions. And this was tested against the ADS CFT correspondence, and it led to very interesting non-trivial checks of the ADS CFT correspondence. So if you read, want to read a little bit more, about this uh, subject in the context of the ADS CFT correspondence and in the context of uh, just field theory. The, uh, the, best, the best source is the TASI lectures of, one of the best sources is the TASI lectures of uh, Doc, the Hawker et al. So you can read about the construction of these uh, half PPS operators and the extremal correlators. And you can, ch and you can see there is a whole uh, discussion there of how this uh, expression matches the ADS CFT Witten diagrams. So there is no yeah. singularity in two of the axes touch. Exactly. So there is no singularity when two of the axes touch. OK, so this was, a, this is, this was believed to be a special property of just the maximally supersymmetric Young-Mills theory. 
but now we know that, uh, let me just now uh, explain. To, uh, now what I want to do is to give you a broad picture of what is true for n equals 2. So for n equals 2, not everything that I've said is true, but some things that are, are still true, and they're very interesting. That's the main subject of the talk. But so let me just tell you what is true with a little bit less supersymmetry. So this is just n, an n equals 2 overview. So the first, the first thing, the fact that we can, so the first thing that is true, which I'll argue soon, is that we can define an analogous sector of operators, which are called chiral ring operators. That's how I'm going to call them. And we can define extremal correlators. So you can define extremal correlators. You can define extremal correlators of chiral ring operators. This is some of chiral ring operators. And it turns out to be still true that the endpoint functions of these operators obey this uh, property. So the dependence is just this funny function, uh, 1 over 1 y minus x to the power 2 delta i. So that still remains true. The thing that is different from n equals 4, which, is, which makes it more interesting, is that the prefactor is now, de now depends on Young-Mills, on the Young-Mills coupling. So the prefactor is a function of the dimensions of n and of the Young-Mills coupling. And unlike in n equals 4, this is a non-trivial function now. So there are corrections in perturbation theory, and also due to instantons. They do not change the dependence and position, but they change the prefactor, which is physical. Yeah. I asked about the physical intuition. Because let's say I didn't have this operator delta. Then when I had two operators nearby, the object exploded. Then I insert this operator somewhere in Andromeda. Yes. Suddenly, it's all pure. <laughs> right. Yes. How, how, does this, how do you see this happening? So, in, I mean, in, you can take like two of these operators, let's say at x1 and x2. You can bring them close to each other. And you have some heavy operator in Andromeda. But this heavy operator is hungry. It needs to soak up all the lines. So if w the OP is when you take some of the lines and you contract them between each other. That's how you get singularities in field theory. But if you contract even one of the lines, then this operator would not be well fed. So it's like saying that uh, if you pick up the singular terms in the OP, what remains has zero overlap with O. So it's just that the form factor vanishes. If you, if you, so there is an OP between these op two operators, but the only term that contributes in that OP is the regular piece. The singular pieces turn out not to contribute. They just have zero overlap exactly with that guy. But is this the statement only in large n? No, no. Uh, so this statement is true for any n. It turns out. So this statement is true for any n. And so the most interesting thing about the n equals 2 counterpart of this story is that the, the function actually depends on the Young-Mills coupling. And not only that, it turns out that we can compute it exactly. So it's not just that we know that there is such a sector and it depends on the coupling. This cu the coupling dependence can be computed exactly. So this is exactly computable in any n equals 2 theory. That's the first interesting thing about it. But furthermore, you might remember that in n equals, it, you might remember that in gauge theories that there is also a theta angle. And it's actually natural to trade a coupling constant for 1 over g and mills plus i theta. So you have tau and tau bar. You might remember the work of Cyborg Witten also uncovered some interesting dependence on the coupling constant. But it was purely holomorphic. So the interesting thing about these exactly computable observables is that they're non-holomorphic. So this goes beyond all the tools that were available like in the 90s, where people knew how to extract holomorphic quantities. So this is non-holomorphic. And we can still <coughs> compute it. Even though it's non-holomorphic, we can still compute it. OK, using uh, modern techniques. So this goes beyond. Uh, this has, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about the physical meaning of these prefactors. You'll see that they can be 
in some special cases used to measure the metric in theory space and the various other connections to mathematics. But basically, it goes beyond the holomorphic uh, data in the cyborg witten curve. And in the special case of n equals 4, you will see explicitly that this just drops out. So it's easy to see that in n equals 4, we recover the old results. OK, so are there any questions about this uh, quick uh, historical overview? So this correlator cannot be uh, decomposed into a product <laughs> Uh, I'll talk about it now. Yeah. Are there any questions about the historical overview? There, like, I just try to, pit, to put the subject into some l slightly broader context. Uh, so that it will be clear what's, why we are discussing that. OK, so. So now I want to discuss the question that already was asked a few times about in what sense we can reduce this to products. I have a question about the overview of n equals 2. So you said that now it depends on coupling. In what sense coupling is not a parameter anymore? So if the theory is confining, then it's not a parameter. So this is kind of a void of content. But uh, here I, sh I, have, I should have said that this is about uh, n equals 2 superconformal field theories, where the coupling is an actual parameter. So there is a vast uh, class of such theories, in particular this uh, class S compactification, class S theories and cyborg witten theories. And they all have like some coupling constants, which are exactly marginal. Any other questions? OK, so I just let's talk a little bit more about what it means for the endpoint function to take that particular form. So we'll, we won't care about the normalization now. I just want to uh, study this uh, particular dependence on the coordinates just to, uh, to try to understand what it means. Uh, following Eliezer's and Tin's questions. So let me remind you of something uh, in conformal field, uh, something rather basic in conformal field theory. So just to try to understand what it means. So let's suppose you have two primary operators, O1 and O2, x and y. And suppose so, so they are primary primary operators, and suppose they have some dimension delta. So it's known that this takes the form 1 over x minus y to the power 2 delta, right? Now suppose you have a three-point function, a three-point function, O1, O2, O3, of some operators of dimension delta 1, delta 2, delta 3. And here I'm not restricting uh, the dimensions to obey this sum rule as for extremal correlators. Sorry, this is z, y, x. So this is going to uh, take the form. I'm dropping the normalization, which is not important now. This is going to take the form x minus y to some power, then x minus z to some power, and y minus z to some power. And now I have to uh, figure out the powers, unfortunately. So <coughs> this is delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3. Uh, this is delta 1 plus delta 3 minus delta 2. This is delta 2 plus delta 3 minus delta 1. Is that correct? Seems correct. OK, so say again. Say again. Uh, yeah, if I put like x minus y squared, then maybe I need to divide by 2. But in this notation, probably not. OK, so uh, following this kind of, so this is generally true for any two primaries op primary operators. There is a very interesting observation uh, that is known from two dimensions. But it's also very useful in higher dimensions. 
So using the conformal group, using the conformal group, we can formally put any operator. So any operator can be formally put at infinity. Okay, so any operator can be formally put at infinity using a conformal transformation. But you have to somehow do it carefully. You don't want to you want you don't want to destroy these formulas. Like, what does it mean if y goes to infinity? It just goes to zero and that's it, right? So when you put an operator at infinity using the conformal transformation, you have to do it in a in a careful manner. And the correct and the prescription is the following. So an operator at infinity is defined to be uh, the following, it's y to the power 2 delta of that operator times the operator at y. And now we send y to infinity in a limiting process. So when we talk about operators at infinity, that's what we mean. That's the, pr that's the limiting procedure that we're doing. And now you can, it turns out that like, we can just take these formulas now and put one of the points at infinity and write down the answers. So for this formula, this will just become, let's say, 0 infinity. Following this prescription, this is just 1. right? So it's, we didn't lose any information. It's just like 1, the prefactor. And also, this turns out to just be 1. Uh, so let's look at the powers of z. So z appears here with power delta 1 plus delta 3 minus delta 2. And here it appears with power delta 2 plus delta 3 minus delta 1. So in total, the power of z in the denominator is 2 times delta 3. So if we multiply it by z times delta 3, these things go away. And what remains is just, so what, OK, there isn't enough space here. I'll just use that blackboard. So the three-point function, O1, O2, let's say x, y, infinity, this three-point function or this is of dimension delta 1, this is of dimension delta 2, this is of dimension delta 3. This just becomes x minus y uh, to the power uh, delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3. Oh, see, you see? So, Oh, and the statement more generally is that all the correlation functions in conformal filters have a nice, uh, behave nicely uh, in this limit. So all correlation functions behave nicely. So all correlation functions behave nicely. Okay. So using these variables, it's actually very useful to rewrite this answer in these variables. It's very useful to put the coordinate y at infinity and see what comes out. So using this uh, procedure, this statement that this is true in conformal filter is entirely equivalent. Oh, I should have said that this process of putting a point at infinity is reversible because the conformal group allows to put any point at infinity. In principle, if somebody tells you the, cor the correlation function where one point is at infinity, you can uh, go back and put all the points at finite distance. So this is a reversible process. It's not like uh, you do it once and that's it. You cannot go back. This process is irreversible. So an alternative way to write this correlation function, which sheds a little bit more light on the meaning of this correlation function, is to write it, uh, is to put the last point at infinity. <coughs> so we have O delta infinity, so this is 1, completely independent of the distance. OK, so that's what it means. This correlation function is secretly independent of the distance. That might ring a bell for those of you who studied supersymmetry uh, in flat space with n equals 1, because there are some correlation functions that are independent of the distance. But this is much more subtle. This is only independent of the distance is one point is, infin is at infinity. It does depend on the distance if the, all the points are generic, but it's independent of the distance when one point is at infinity. So it's a slightly different statement than those that you've encountered in uh, classic books about supersymmetry, but it's, it's true. 
So what does it mean? It means that since it's independent of the distance, we can just OP these guys. You know, we can just OP these guys until everything dies out. All, only the regular pieces can survive. So let's write it up. Let's write it down uh, concretely. So the consequence of this is now clear. So consequently, the operators at the so the operators the operators at the, the xi at the points at xi can be brought near each other. So you can just pile them all together in a small uh, section of space. O1, O2, On and just OP them. So you OP them all, and you get some new operator O twiddle, which sits at like zero. So these correlation functions are really, in some sense, correlation numbers, but not correlation functions, because the functional <coughs> dependence is kind of uh, mis There isn't really functional dependence here on the coordinates, in some sense. So the, what you want to compute are just these numbers. And these numbers come from the relations of multiplying these operators and extracting the regular pieces. So only regular pieces matter. Only the regular pieces matter. <coughs> so it's not like you can straightforwardly compute these correlation functions. You still need to know how to multiply these operators. But, and it might depend on the coupling constant, as I said. So in principle, this will be a function of uh, G and Mills and stuff. It's not trivial, but uh, it's simpler than what it could have been. OK, so now n equals 2. Are there any more questions about the setup? OK, so now n equals 2. So first, we have to identify the operators in n equals 2 conformal filters that may enjoy uh, these interesting properties. So I'll, I'll just uh, identify that sector on this blackboard. And then we'll try to analyze it. So we're talking about n equals 2 in four dimensions. And we're talking about so con super conformal field theory. Uh, not, there hasn't been much work about. There hasn't been a lot, of, a lot of work on what happens if the theory is not conformal. Then this, the questions that you might want to ask are a little bit different. Uh, people have not quite pursued that. But for conformal field theories, there has been quite a bit of work. So we have supercharges, which are Q alpha i and Q bar uh, alpha i alpha dot i. These are the ordinary supercharges. And then there are the super conformal supercharges of n equals 2. And as usual, i runs from 1 to 2. This is the n equals 2. And alpha is a Lorentz index, which likewise runs over the indices 1 and 2. The theory has a conformal symmetry, which is S of 5, comma 1 in Euclidean signature. And in addition, it has an R symmetry. There is an R symmetry in such superconformal field theories, which is SU2R times U1R. So local operators are labeled by the, some highest weight representation of this algebra. You must have seen this algebra before, so I'm not going to review it. So what are the super what are the primaries 
the superconformal primaries. These are the highest weight states of this algebra. And they are annihilated by S and by S bar. Because S and S bar should be interpreted, as you remember, as raising operators. <coughs> so the highest weight states or the superconformal prior primaries are annihilated by these guys. And the quantum numbers of the quantum numbers of these primaries are so the quantum numbers of such primaries are first the dimension of the operator, then uh, there is the spin. The spin in four dimensions is labeled, the spin of a local operator is labeled by uh, two SU2 quantum numbers, J left and J right, because uh, the Lorentz symmetry in Euclidean space is SO4, which is SU2 times SU2. And so it's labeled by two SU2 quantum numbers. Like all the operators are labeled in this way. And then there are the quantum numbers under the SU2 times U1 R symmetry. So the, the spin under the SU2 R symmetry is S. And the spin under the U1, uh, sorry, and the, and the U1R charge is going to be labeled by, uh, by capital R. So this is the SU2 quantum number, and this is the U1 quantum number. So all the highest weight states are labeled by these uh, five uh, quantum numbers. All the local operators are lab labeled by these guys. OK. So of course, in principle, we're interested in all the operators of the conformal field theory. And this is what the bootstrap program is about. But then there, are, there is a huge amount of work on various uh, special cases of these highest weight operators that uh, obey various additional conditions. So there is a, a huge amount of work On a, a special sub on subsets or special subsets, special uh, classes of uh, such operators. Okay, so uh, the superconformal index, uh, uh, the Schur operators, the chiral algebra, the chiral ring, all of those uh, things are just names for various uh, subclasses of these operators which obey additional properties. So here, I want to remind you what, are, what is known about the half BPS operators of n equals 4, of n equals 2 superconformal field theories. So I'll just give you a quick, uh, a quick um, reminder of what is known about half BPS operators. So I'll actually start with those that I'm going to be eventually interested in. So these are half BPS, meaning by half BPS, what we mean is that, OK, so primary highest weight, highest weight operators are already annihilated by all the S's. So by half BPS, I mean that they're also annihilated by a half of these Q's. So in total, we have eight Q's here and eight S's. So half BPS means that they are annihilated by a half of the eight Q's, meaning four Q's. So there are two natural ways to do it. One is that it's annihilated by all the Q bars. So this is an additional restriction we can impose on the operator O, the highest weight operator O. And with this additional restriction, uh, it will obey like further conditions on its quantum numbers. And uh, in fact, such operators are called chiral operators or chiral ring operators, sometimes chiral ring operators. Sometimes people call them Coulomb branch operators. Uh, maybe it, no, it looks misspelled, right? It's fine. it's fine, yeah. Coulomb branch operators. So that's another name. So these are all names for this, uh, for this uh, class of operators. Chiral operators, chiral ring operators, Coulomb branch operators. These are all the same, like names representing the same thing. And in fact, those operators are going to be the main focus of these lectures. So what are the properties of these operators? 
don't you don't get Kaira uh, Higgs branch operators? No, he, I'll, I'll talk about Higgs branch operators soon. They're not of this type. So I'll, there, yeah, I'll talk about all the half BPS operators of both types. So first I'll talk about these operators, and then I'll talk about what uh, you call the Higgs branch operators. OK, so. So from the, super, from the n equals 2 superconformal al algebra, the n equals 2 superconformal algebra, very, very schematically, is that if you take q and s and you commute them, let's say q bar and s bar, let's say that you anti-commute q, q bar and s bar, you get a, a bunch of epsilon tensors, delta plus r, with some coefficients. This is very, very schematically. Plus Lorentz generators and plus the scaling dimension. Well, sorry, it's already, I, I meant the R symmetry. Uh, the scaling dimension is already here. So very, very schematically, that's the n equals 2 algebra. If you do the commutator of Q and S, you get the scaling dimension, uh, some R symmetry, and this is, and this is the SU2 R symmetry. This is the U1R symmetry. So that's the very schematic structure of the n equals 2 superconformal algebra. So you could just look it up. Let's say in, in, the, in the, this is uh, written very carefully in, in the paper of Minuala et al on the superconformal index. So they have all the conventions and all the factors. So you could reproduce what I'm uh, telling you by uh, looking at their appendix. So if you just impose that O is the highest weight state that's annihilated by S bar, but also by Q bar, also annihilated by Q bar, then this imposes various restrictions on the possible U1R symmetry quantum numbers, the dimensions, the Lorentz quantum numbers, and the SU2 quantum numbers. So these conditions impose various restrictions. And what it turns out is that it imposes the following condition, that JR has to vanish. So this is a general property of any half BPS operator, which is a Coulomb branch operator or a chiral ring operator. JR has to vanish, S has to vanish. Remember that S was the SU2R quantum number. And in addition, delta is R over two in absolute value, where R is the U1 quantum number. So the dimension is fixed in terms of the R symmetry quantum number. So the U1R, U1R quantum number of that operator fixes its scaling dimension exactly. So this cannot receive, receive quantum corrections. It follows from kinematics, from the superconformal algebra. And also, one of the spins inside SO4 has to vanish. Now, there is an interesting conjecture here that. Restrictions on the J Exactly. So that there is an. In so, you know, people have been looking at that for ages for like 10 years now. And it's striking that uh, there is no restriction on the left moving spin of that operator. The, this is especially puzzling given the fact that we have tons of Lagrangian constructions of such superconformal filters using cyber uh, theory and many quiver gauge theories. There are tons of Lagrangian constructions So we have tons of uh, Lagrangian constructions of such n equals two superconformal filters, and in all of them, all the Coulomb branch operators satisfy in addition this restriction. In all of them, in all the known Lagrangian theories, this is true. So a natural conjecture is perhaps this is always true, but nobody has been able to prove it. So this is an open question. So there is an open question of whether there exists any n equals two superconformal field theory out there with a Coulomb branch operator that is spinning. Uh, that's an open question. For these lectures, I'll assume that they don't exist. I'll just make this assumption. Is there any common example for non-Lagrangian theory? I do not know. I, 
my uh, I, I'm not an expert on the non-Lagrangian constructions, but I don't want to quote Matt Buick, and, Matt Buick and incorrectly, but Matt Buick and told me that there are no examples. In fact, he has a paper saying that there are no examples, I think. I believe this is a, a reasonable conjecture to make, that, uh, that there are no such operators, uh, as far as I know. Now, in Lagrangian theories, it's very easy to prove, by the way. In Lagrangian theories, it's really like, you know, one hour of thinking and you can prove it. It's not a, it's not a hard question. Assuming that you know how to write down all the operators and stuff like that. So these are, uh, these are some basic facts about Coulomb branch operators. Uh, let's continue discussing Coulomb branch operators. So the interesting thing, which uh, will resonate with what we said before, is this equation. I have not been very careful about what this absolute value means. So for the half BPS operators that <laughs> obey this equation, but you could also envision half BPS operators obeying the other equation, with, where you replace Q, ba Q bar by Q, those will be called anti-chiral ring operators or anti-Coulomb branch operators. Okay, so th those are anti-chiral anti operators. Now, you could try to ask what happens if you impose that b O is both chiral and anti-chiral. That would mean that it must be the unit operator. So it has to be either that or that or none, but it cannot be both unless it's the unit operator. So, so the, the meaning of this fo formula is that delta is R over 2 for chiral ring operators or Coulomb branch operators, and it's minus R over 2 for anti-chiral. And that leads to some interesting consequences for the OP of two chiral operators. So this should be possible to expand in terms of the other operators in the theory. Uh, let's say at x. With various, OK, so let me just write it down more carefully. So it should be possible to expand that product in terms of a k, i, j, x, y, it should be possible to write down such an expansion, but this would not be not chiral, not necessarily chiral. Okay, these are just like all the operators in the theory at first sight. Okay, um, <coughs> so so the fact that these two operators are chiral does lead to some restrictions on this OP, which I would like to mention now. So the total Let's say that this is O1, this is I, and this is J. Sorry, so this is OI, this is OJ. Let's say that uh, the R charge of this guy is RI, and the R charge of that guy is RJ. So the R charge of the right-hand side must be RI plus RJ. So the R charge of, this, of the right-hand side must be RI plus RJ. So the only operators that could appear on the right-hand side are operators whose R charge is RI plus RJ, and that they have no SU2. R, R, R charge. So there must be neutral under the SU2 R charge. And because there is a general inequality, so you can prove a general inequality for any operator in the theory, this is always true. This is a unitarity bound. And this unitarity bound is saturated by chiral and anti chiral operators. So you can prove such an inequality. It means that there cannot be singular terms here. So the only operators that can appear on the right-hand side have dimension at least bigger than the sum of the dimensions of the left-hand side. So it's like a triangle inequality of some sort. And therefore, there cannot be singular terms. So no singular terms. And that may resonate with what we discussed a little bit before about these endpoint functions, that they have no singularities. So in the OP of two chiral operators, there cannot be singular terms. And in fact, the term that is non-singular so the term that is uh, independent of x and y is a chiral ring operator, since its dimension must be exactly r, r i plus r j. 
So the non-singular, there's order one, the order one term, meaning the term that doesn't depend on x minus y. <coughs> so the order one term is a chiral ring operator, is another chiral ring operator, is another chiral ring operator. So we can write, loosely speaking, uh, without any x dependence now. OK, plus uh, non chiral ring. OK, that would be enough for our purposes. And these are chiral ring operators. And there is no x dependence here now. Absolutely no x dependence. So this could be x, y, but this is independent of x minus y. So you can put this at x, this at y, this at x. So uh, the chiral ring operators form a form a ring, that's where the name comes from. You multiply two, you get a third one with some coefficients. And these coefficients may depend on the coupling constants. And in some, uh, as you will see, the computation of extremal correlation functions is equivalent to computing these OP coefficients as a function of the coupling constant. Why is that? You remember that we argued that with the endpoint functions can be computed by just OPing all the operators. So you can just, op if you knew all these coefficients, you could just reduce any end product of operators to a sum over single operators, and then you would be done. The two-point function would all that would be the only thing that remains. So these are coupling constant dependent. So I haven't proved that yet, but we will prove that those don't make a contribution. So if you picked up any contribution in the OP from the non-chiral ring operators, it would be exactly orthogonal to the extremal correlator. So you'll just get zero. So but these coefficients are coupling constant dependence, and they're the main task to computing, computing these coefficients as an exact function of the coupling constants. And it, as I said, it turns out to be a non-holomorphic function of the coupling constants, unlike uh, the holomorphic data in the cyber witten curve. So this cannot be extracted from the cyber witten curve in any way. Okay, so this is uh, one comment about these operators. About the chiral ring operators. Another thing about the chiral ring operators, which is what made me interested in the subject in the first place, is that there is a special case where the R charge is four. So if the R charge is four, these operators are quite interesting. If the R charge of these operators is four, then the dimension is two. And therefore, we can add them to the action. So this is the superspace integral. So, so to speak, the n equals two superpotential. And we can just add these operators, O. So this is a supersymmetric deformation. And it's exactly marginal. because the dimension of this guy is two, and the dimension of this guy is two. So therefore, this is the deformation of the Lagrangian. So therefore, the Lagrangian is deformed by a dimension four operator. And this is why it's exactly, I haven't proven that it's exactly marginal. From this, it follows only that it's perhaps marginal, but it turns out to be exactly marginal. That I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to prove. So in particular, if we can compute correlation functions of OO dagger, for instance, that would be the Zama logic of metric. Because this is the, this is basic, these are exactly marginal deformation of the theory, and the two-point functions measure distances between theories. I'll explain this mu in much more detail in the upcoming lectures. So this measures distances in theory space. <coughs> So this is like a special case of an extremal correlator that measures distances in theory space. And uh, this is a very canonical observable in any family of conformal filters. And the fact that we can compute it exactly is uh, very, very nice. So that's uh, an additional interesting thing about extremal correlators in n equals two and the chiral ring operators. Okay. I want to now mention one last conjecture about chiral ring operators, and then I'll talk about Higgs branch operators, which is the other family of a half BPS operators, 
which uh, has some own interesting properties, but it's uh, far less interesting in Lagrangian theories, it turns out. So I want to mention one last property here before I move on to the other half BPS operators of n equals 2. The last property is also conjecture, is also a well, it's a conjecture that may be false, but it's like a false conjecture. Uh, in some, uh, I'll, ex I'll say, uh, I'll explain what I mean. So, in all the Lagrangian theories, in all Lagrangian SCFTs, in all the Lagrangian SCFTs, uh, this was, this is true about the spin. You remember, I told you about this open question about the spin. But there is another property that is true in all the Lagrangian SCFTs, which is that the ring is freely generated. So there is really a ring structure here that you multiply operators. There is no singularity in the OP, and you get some new operator, which is in the chiral ring. So the chiral ring is closed under multiplication. So you, it's a real ring in the mathematical sense. So it turns out that in all the known Lagrangian constructions, the ring is freely generated. Freely generated. What is a freely generated ring? It will be important for what we discussed soon. What is a freely generated ring? A freely generated, finitely, finitely and freely generated ring. I, really, sorry, wait, is it finitely? No, the, I'm, I'm suspe suspecting that this might not be tr always true. Um, I'm a freely generated ring is a ring that has a, some elements, let's say a i, a w, a k, let's say a l, such that any other ring element is, ga is given in a unique fashion by products of a1, a2, a l with some powers. And there is no double counting, so there is no redundancy. Any word that you write using these letters is like a new element in the ring. And products of words obey uh, the intuitive multiplication law, where you add the powers as appropriate, and that's it. So a freely generated ring is essentially a ring where there are no relations. A ring that, co that could have relation is like A1, A2 is the same as A3, A4. That would be a ring with a relation. But a freely generated ring is something where every word uh, counts differently. differently. So every, one, ev every word is different from any other word. So all different. So these are all different. So any operator can be generated by some uh, a term like that, the sums of terms like that, and every such term is unique and independent of the others. So that's what freely generated means. And okay, so since it's true for all the Lagrangian CF SCFTs that the chiral ring is freely generated, uh, it, it, people were compelled to make this conjecture more generally. But then there are recent claims that there are some non-Lagrangian theories that violate it. But these are not really true violations of this conjecture. If you look in the details, then the ring there is not freely generated for like stupid reasons, because you projected out something. Uh, so it's not a genuine violation of this conjecture. So what, what do you mean by that? So there are these constructions where you... I mean, we have a paper on the Schumacher Right. We have to calculate it, and we see that it's not freely generated. Right. But uh, when a ring is not freely generated, it could be that it's genuinely not freely generated, or that perhaps uh, you could obtain the theory from gauging some discrete symmetry in a theory where it is freely generated. So as far as I know, all the constructions where it's not freely generated are obtained by just uh, gauging some freely generated ring, right? Now, Argyris has also a claim that he has the construction of some models where it's not like that. But these are, as you know, these constructions are still, the verdict is still out. It's not, it's not yet out. The verdict is not yet out. So it could be that this conjecture is still true. In any case, it's true in all the Lagrangian theories. OK, so this is what I, got, I, want, I wanted to say about this uh, sector of half BPS operators. And now I just want for, for the completeness of your, so to speak, education. So, so yeah. I wanted to read it to uh, another uh, conjecture that the uh, uh, Kung Fu called uh, this is not a conjecture. This is a trivial. I mean, uh, there, what uh, <coughs> what we can say is the following: 
So here we describe some exactly marginal deformations. Okay? You can ask, uh, could there be also other exactly marginal deformations? And the answer is no. This is not a conjecture. So these are all the exactly, all the exactly marginal deformations must be uh, integrals over chiral ring operators. Is that what you meant? I mean, I mean coupling constant. Well, I don't think that this. Uh, uh, you, you, okay, you could say that in all the known examples, these exactly marginal deformations can be viewed as ca gauge coupling constants of some gauge groups. So yeah, we could add that. So all the exactly marginal operators must be of this form. This is easy to show. And yeah, and also we can say that in all the Lagrangian examples, in all the Lagrangian examples, uh, these exactly marginal operators can be viewed as the young Mills coupling constants and theta angles for some gauge groups, for some simply connected, uh, sorry, simple gauge groups, semi-simple semi gauge groups and U1 factors and so on. Okay. So these exactly marginal parameters are always just young mill coupling, young mills uh, cu coupling constants and theta angles. <coughs> okay. Now I want to finish this uh, last ten minutes. I want to tell you about the other half BPS operators so that you have a broader vision, a broader view of the literature, because there is a huge amount of literature on the chiral ring, the Coulomb branch operator, and then there is a, a, an ever increasing literature on the other half BPS sector of the theory, which is the Higgs branch. So the Higgs branch operators are defined by a different condition. So our operators were annihilated by four out of eight. R remember, so we had these eight guys. And the chiral ring is defined by all those operators that are annihilated by those four out of eight. But the Higgs branch is defined by taking two from here and two from here. OK, so it's a different, uh, different uh, subalgebra. So the Higgs branch operators are defined by the condition that they are annihilated by uh, Q alpha 1. So I'll call these operators H. And by Q bar 2. No, sorry, Q bar 1. Uh, alpha dot. So this is, the Higgs, this is another half BPS uh, sector of the theory. And this also has many names. Uh, sometimes people call it the Higgs branch which is analogous to that Coulomb branch. So this is like the Higgs branch sector. And sometimes I think more is mostly, well, sometimes people call it the Schur sector, but this is not entirely precise terminology. So let's just leave it at that. Higgs branch, sec H Higgs, Higgs branch sector. So you can follow a similar logic and uh, find the quantum numbers of these operators. And here, what f one finds is that j left equals j right equals uh, r equals 0. So unlike the operators that we've uh, described before, which had non-vanishing u1 r, r charge, these operators have vanishing u1 r charge, but they have non-zero dimension and non-zero su2 <coughs> r symmetry spin. And the, the relation is that delta is equal to 2s. S is the Casimir of the SU2 representation. So the dimension of these operators is 2 times the Casimir of the SU2 representation. So this is another sector of operators. And they also have interesting correlation functions. But what turns out is that uh, the, the, the OP of these operators is also interesting. So there is some kind of analogous structure to this. But here there is coupling, constants de coupling constant dependence. So these products, this ring relation, these ring coefficients have perturbative as well as non-perturbative corrections. But in the Higgs branch, it turns out that the coefficients C, I, J, K for the Higgs, op for the Higgs branch, those turn out to be uh, three level exact. So there is no, there, there are no quantum corrections, and at least for Lagrangian theories, this is therefore very boring. But for non-Lagrangian theories, these are still interesting observables. So this is interesting, especially in non-Lagrangian theories. But in Lagrangian theories, uh, there isn't much to discuss. This is uh, 
can be computed. This can be computed with coupling, and that, that's it. So th there is nothing to, to discuss. Okay, so this is the other sector about which there is a lot of work, but mostly about non-Lagrangian theories. While the chiral ring, the Coulomb branch operators are interesting even in perturbation theory, or non-trivial even in perturbation theory. So this is a. Uh, I need to say that uh, this uh, X branch is uh, Say again. Say again. I, I did. How to say this is trivial? How to say it's trivial? How, how do you see? Oh, how do you see that the 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 that the. Um, that this is uh, independent of the coupling constant? That's a very good question. So the answer is actually uh, intuitively the following. So the coupling constant dependence comes from the exactly marginal deformations. These are our coupling constants, right? So we have a space of theories, which are parameterized by the Young-Mills couplings and the theta angles. And uh, changing the Young-Mills coupling is like adding a deformation. But as I told you, all the exactly marginal operators, they are Coulomb branch operators. So vaguely speaking, it is true that the Coulomb branch operators and the Higgs branch operators don't talk to each other. So the data of the Higgs branch operators does not care about the deformations in the Coulomb branch sector. And it just so happens that the Young-Mills coupling constant is a Coulomb branch parameter, not the Higgs branch parameter. So that's why, roughly speaking, the Higgs branch operators do not care about the Young-Mills coupling. It's just that in n equals two theories, the Young-Mills coupling is a Coulomb branch parameter. It's the coefficient of a Coulomb branch deformation, not the Higgs branch deformation. OK, so this is, roughly speaking, the intuitive reason. If you know a little bit about two dimensions, you can make it much more precise, because there are chirals and twisted chirals. And it's kind of analogous to this statement. Now, physically, these two half BPS uh, sectors have a, another important interpretation. That's that would be the last, uh, last thing I want to say today. So typically. When we study supersymmetric gauge, supersymmetric field theories, uh, especially those n equals two theories that we have in mind, typically we have a superconformal field theory, which is some, you know, some interacting superconformal field theory, and this theory has some coupling constants, g and mills and theta. But in addition, it has a vacuum manifold, so there are non-trivial vacua, like the generate super selection sectors. So we, 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 we must not be confused about the space of theories, which are parameterized by the Young-Mills couplings and the theta angles, and the space of vacua, which are just different super selection sectors in infinite volume. So for example, in n equals 4, we have um, a huge moduli space of vacua, which is like R6 mod gamma. So these are vacua, not deformations of the theory. In any case, what I wanted to say is that typically, in n equals 2 theories, if you look at the space of vacua, there are vacua that are that on which there is the U1 R symmetry is spontaneously broken. And then there is like an orthogonal space, so to speak, like orthogonal space, where SU2 R is spontaneously broken. So this vacua have uh, Goldstone bosons. So the Higgs branch operators, their expectation values in the su new super selection sectors parameterize this space, and the Coulomb branch operators parameterize this space. So typically, the vacuum manifold of n equals two theories look like Higgs branches and Coulomb branches, and they're essentially orthogonal. Essentially orthogonal. There are also mixed branches, but they're essentially orthogonal. And uh, so the vacuum expectation values of Coulomb branch operators and Higgs branch operators parameterize uh, those spaces. So you can think about Coulomb branch operators and Higgs branch operators. So these are Coulomb branch and Higgs branch as order parameters for the spontaneous breaking of uh, SU2 and u1. So this is a u1 order parameter. And this is su2 order parameter. So the physical meaning of these operators is, uh, is that they parameterize these spaces. And then you can ask, what is then the physical meaning of these coefficients? Well, these coefficients, roughly speaking, capture the geometric structure of these spaces, but their coupling constant dependence is more subtle. Uh, I, I, I don't, I mean, in some cases, we know exactly what that coupling constant dependence means. We'll discuss some of those cases. But in general, I don't know geometrically what it means. 
but there are some cases in which we'll discuss this question. So this, these are the half BPS sectors. And as I already hinted, we'll be interested in those, in the, in the Coulomb branch operators. And we'll show that they obey very similar properties to the extremal correlators in n equals 4. And we will compute those coefficients uh, exactly using localization and then study some of the resurgence properties. Are there any questions? Can you flow from, the, from one branch to another? Uh, yes, yes, there are. Yeah, there are various massive deformations of the theories that uh, allow you to, like you have a super conformal field theory and all these backward degenerate, but you could add a mass. And then in some situations you can think about it as if the mass just forces you to go on one of those branches. Yeah, and you can also start from the Higgs branch, add some terms to the action, go to some points on the Coulomb branch. Like the famous story of uh, cyborg wit so there is cyborg witten theory. All the action, so to speak, all the, all the interesting stuff happens on the Coulomb branch. The Higgs branch doesn't participate in that story. It's not very normalized. There are no instantons. And it's all essentially because the Coulomb branch, the young mills coupling is the Coulomb branch parameter. So the Higgs branch doesn't participate in most of those examples. So all the action is happening on the Coulomb branch. There, this, there is a monopole point, a dion point, and there is no conformal filter in the, in the first construction. But then there is yeah, the conformal version and yeah, so the Coulomb branch is quite complicated generally. There are lots of singularities, like Argyris Douglas singularities. And yeah. Oh, sorry, what do you mean by super selection rules? Or? Super selection rules? Yeah, so the back um, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm just talking about like. Um, Say, say, okay. I'll give you an example. Maybe an example would clarify what I mean. I, I just mean like vacuo in infinite volume. But like in quantum mechanics, if you have such a potential, then how many ground states have you got? Hmm? One, right? Like the superposition of psi plus and psi minus. Where like there is a Gaussian here and it's a Gaussian here. So, but in quantum filtery, when we draw such a potential, like phi squared plus phi to the four. How many ground states have we got in quantum field theory? One or two? <laughs> two. <laughs> no, no. So not one. <laughs> two. Okay. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I should give a separate lecture about what is the large volume limit. And no, but more seriously, the, the instanton action uh, has a factor of volume in it. So as you remember, you can compare these two states. In quantum mechanics, you can compare these two states. And the energy difference is an exponential in minus the instanton action. Now in quantum field theory, we have, uh, it's not quantum mechanics. We don't have just one degree of freedom sitting at one point. We have infinitely many degrees of freedom filling out an infinite volume. And so you can think about it as if there is like a, like think about quantum filtery in a lattice uh, approximation. So when we write such a potential in quantum filtery, that means that each lattice degree of freedom has such a potential. And so to tunnel from this to that, you don't need just one of the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom to tunnel. You need all the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom to tunnel. So the instant on action is e to the minus the volume like the total number of lattice sites times the action of like the quantum mechanical instant on tunneling, which is finite. So that kills the, that kills the, the exponent in the, in the thermodynamic limit, in the large volume limit. So in quantum field theory, actually, when we draw such a potential, we have two ground states, not one. OK? So, and this is what's called super selection sectors. That's what people say. When people say super selection sector, that's what they mean. It's an artifact of infinite volume. So this is very typical in the supersymmetric filter is that uh, there are many vacua, many super selection sectors. So the potential, the scalar potential in quantum filter is typically, in, with supersymmetry, is typically flat. So in quantum mechanics, when you have a flat potential, you still have just one ground state. 
right? What quantum mechanics with a flat, poten with a flat potential has this kind of uh, wave functions, and there is only one ground state, which is the constant wave function. But in quantum field theory, if you have a flat potential, you have infinitely many ground states. Because uh, for the same reason, like the volume suppression is not in, OK? There is a sm if you want to know more, then there is an exception for uh, two dimensions. In two dimensions, if you have an exactly flat potential, there is some logarithm. And in fact, uh, it's like more like quantum mechanics. But above two dimensions, if you have a flat potential, then you have genuine flat super selection sectors. OK? It's related to why there's no Goldstone bosons. Right, in Goldstone boson, yeah, there are no Goldstone bosons in two dimensions because this uh, picture is too crude. Uh, the reason being that if the potential is exactly flat, in addition to the volume suppression, there is also uh, the cor you have to take into account correlations. So here I ignored completely correlations, as you've seen. I just assumed that each lattice site has some probability of tunneling, and then I just multiplied by the volume. This is a correct approximation. If there, is no if there are no strong correlation functions. But if there are strong correlation functions, like in massless theories in two dimensions, then this volume factor can get erased. And that's what happens in two dimensions. But above two dimensions, there is no such subtlety. Yes? Uh, I'm just curious, how is it possible to uh, compute the OP for its property? The Higgs branch. Uh, Operators uh, can be written like, if you have a coupling constant G and Mills, then you can just write down all your Higgs branch operators by just finding all the classical operators made out of the classical fields uh, that obey this condition, that Q bar annihilates them and Q annihilates them. You just write them all down. And that's it. You're done. There is no renormalization there. You can compute it at zero coupling. Oh, he's, he's asking about the non-Lagrangian. Ah, you're asking about non-Lagrangian? No, for non-Lagrangian theories, it's, a, it's an art. I mean, because there is nowhere to start. So you have to use much more sophisticated techniques. Also, the chiral ring operators, uh, we don't know how to compute them in non-Lagrangian theories in general. Like, we don't know how to compute the CIJK in non-Lagrangian theories in general. I mean, because there is no coupling constant to, to expand in. Yeah, so there are some special cases in which people have c found like ingenuine methods uh, to do it using uh, very s more sophisticated techniques. Any more questions? Okay, thanks so much.